you very much for having me here today. It's a pleasure to join you for this conference. I'm sorry that I can't participate more fully. Um, it's graduation weekend at UK, and um, I have a doctoral student graduating. So, and it's also grant season, and we have an application that's due today. So I couldn't come down yesterday as I had planned because I think my colleagues would have been very upset with me running out to go have a good time while they finished the application. And this morning I was actually sitting here emailing um, regarding that application. So um, I apologize. I have to leave right after this. And I really just got here. So um, I know that it's my loss that I'm, I'm missing out on a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Um, but I do appreciate you having me, if only briefly, to participate in the conference. Um, in their new book, Conservative Criminology, A Call to Restore Balance to the Social Sciences, John Paul Wright and Matt DeLissi spend about five and a half pages critiquing feminist criminologists' analyses of the family court system and men's rights groups in the United States. Wright and Delissy state, and I quote, stepping away from the intellectual strain of reading quasi-scholarly feminist diatribes, we note how feminist ideology explicitly supports blatant discrimination and the use of repressive and invasive methods of governmental control, and how it seeks to pathologicalize its critics. Feminist criminologists who at national criminology conferences pass around pink buttons with the saying, quiet women rarely make history stamped on them, have rarely played by the rules of, communi of the community civility game. This is part of the leftist orientation of criminologists that we rail against. They accept, directly or implicitly, the tyranny of the state if it conforms to their ideological view and they pathologicalize or discredit those who question their presumed authority. End of quote. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> a disturbing characterization? Yeah, I'd say so. A fair characterization? Certainly not. Indeed, it is a characterization, and I'm not going to dignify it by calling it an analysis. It is a characterization that is largely patently false. It shows a profound misunderstanding of feminist criminology which reflects the author's complete unwillingness to even engage the paradigm, to try to understand it. But as problematic as I find this most recent attack on feminist criminology by these conservative male criminologists, I'm less disturbed by it than I am by recent negative characterizations of feminist criminology by some critical criminologists and the continued lack of attention by others to what feminist criminology has to offer critical criminology. In fact, this is one way, and I'm hoping perhaps the only way, that the work of conservative criminologists like Wright and Delizzi is similar to that of some critical criminologists. Apart from their five and a half page rant, there is very little mention of feminist criminology in the remainder of their book. Of the 130 pages of text in the book, Feminist criminology appears on only three other pages, and I suppose we should be very grateful for that. <laughs> um, what I will argue here today, though, is that some critical criminologists also continue to marginalize feminist criminology, despite the fact that feminist criminology and critical criminology share much in common. Let me first say that I, I recognize there are many iterations of critical criminology, just as there are various feminist criminologies, including what some call feminist critical criminology. My focus today is going to be on realist critical criminology for the simple reason that it's the brand of critical criminology that I've been reading most of late. But as Joanne Belknap pointed out in her presidential address to the American Society of Criminology in 2015, Concern may be expressed about the frequent omission of gender as well as race in the work of many Marxist, socialist, and critical criminologists. And as Joanne puts it, those who work within many of the other labels this approach has included, which is further problematic when such lapses are not even acknowledged by these criminologists. The contributions of realist 
critical criminology are many and significant. Left realist criminology is credited with giving Marxist and critical criminologists, especially the new criminologists or left idealists of the 1960s and 1970s, a much needed wake up call by arguing that street crime and its effects must be taken seriously rather than being cavalierly dismissed or romanticized as proletarian rebellion against capitalist oppression. As left realists pointed out, the typical street criminal is not a contemporary Jean Valjean, stealing so starving family members may eat, or Robin Hood seeking to redistribute private property from the wealthy to the poor. Though most offenders known to the police are certainly poor, they also typically prey on other poor people. <coughs> Individuals living in low-income households not only have the highest arrest rates, they also have the highest victimization rates, more than twice the victimization rate of those living in high-income households. With work that be began appearing in the mid-1980s, left realists such as Jock Young, Elliot Curry, and Roger, Roger Matthews emphasized the significant consequences <coughs> that living in disadvantaged, high-crime neighborhoods had on residents. But while they urged criminologists to take street crime seriously, left critical realists also distanced themselves from the conservative right realist crime control policies that favored getting tough on offenders with longer and harsher prison sentences, the reinstitution of chain gangs, and militarized policing. In fact, left realists have expressed concern about the cost of more sweeping and repressive crime control policies since it is the working class and the poor who bear a disproportionate burden of financing our expensive but inefficient and unjust legal system, often through taxes or funding cuts to social programs. Now at about the same time that left realists were urging critical criminologists to take crime seriously, Feminist criminologists were issuing a similar call to criminologists generally and to the new criminologists, the critical criminologists in particular, since while we have um, expected mainstream and conservative criminologists to ignore or dismiss feminist criminology, we've had higher expectations of critical criminologists. As I document in my book, Feminist Criminology, Marxist feminist radical feminist and socialist feminist chronologists in the 70s and 80s pointed to the conspicuous absence of an analysis of gender in most criminological research, including the research of many critical criminologists. For example, in the New Criminology, considered by many to be the groundbreaking book in critical criminology, authors Taylor, Walton, and Young completely ignored the relevance of gender or the need to analyze offending by women and girls. At the same time, feminists drew attention to the gendered nature of criminal victimization and the vulnerability of women and girls to certain crimes, such as sexual assault and intimate partner violence, crimes also largely ignored by critical criminologists. Not only were these crimes neglected in both mainstream and criminal, crim, critical criminological research, they also were not given appropriate attention by the criminal legal system, which tended to blame victims and leave perpetrators unaccountable. Feminist criminologists therefore called on the discipline, as well as the criminal legal system, to take crimes by and against women and girls seriously. So given what strikes me as an obvious compatibility between left critical realism and feminist criminology, it's been with some dismay that I've watched the two perspectives develop more in power parallel rather than synergistically. To be sure, there is a small group of feminist left realist criminologists, including people like Walter de Cassaretti and Martin Schwartz, who are perhaps best known for drawing on left realism to explain crimes committed, as they put it, behind closed doors by patriarchal abusive men. What sets feminist left realism apart, as articulated <coughs> by de Cassaretti and Schwartz, is the foregrounding of gender and an analysis of how gender intersects with race, social class, sexual orientation, and other marginalizing variables to shape both offending and victimization. As de Kessereddy and Schwartz point out, despite several revisions, left critical realism has largely remained gender blind. One recent and particularly blatant example of this gender blindness is Roger Matthews' book, Realist Criminology, 
published in 2014. And I single this book out primarily for two reasons. First, in realist criminology, Matthews first traces the historical development of left realism and discusses the need for a broadening of the perspective so as to respond to what he calls the deepening crisis in criminology with, and I quote, an approach that is theory driven while being evidence based, end of quote. In other words, in this book, Matthew, Matthews presents both a primer on critical realism as well as a manifesto or a roadmap for its future development. Second, the book not only exemplifies the tradition of gender-blind critical realist criminology, it has, at times, a disturbing anti-feminist ring to it. Matthews lays out the essential tenets of critical realist theory and methodology, and throughout the book, he clearly and carefully distinguishes critical realist criminology from other, that is, positivist, liberal, and idealist criminologies, offering provocative insights along the way that I expect will ignite debate and may ultimately enrich criminological theorizing and research. But although he devotes considerable space to comparing and contrasting critical realism with other criminological perspectives, Matthews discusses the impact of feminist criminology in just four pages, pages 9 to 12, although he mentions it in a couple of other spots with a sentence or two largely dismissing it with the claim that, and I quote, over the last decade or so, feminist criminology, like feminism in general, has lost much of its radical impact and has gravitated toward liberal feminism, focusing increasingly on specific issues rather than engaging in wider debates about patriarchy and gender inequality, end of quote. Such an assessment, I think, suggests a shocking lack of familiarity with contemporary feminist criminological perspectives and with contemporary feminisms more broadly. So for the rest of my time this afternoon, I'd like to discuss what I consider to be a few of the most significant developments in feminist criminology and worldwide feminist movements and identify what I think are the potential benefits to critical realism were critical realist criminologists to engage more collaboratively with their feminist colleagues. First though, I just want to make a few points of clarification. On page 9 of Realist Criminology, Matthew writes, quote, there is some uncertainty about exactly what is meant by feminist criminology. Now, my obvious question in response to this claim is, uncertainty for whom? Although there is diversity within feminist criminology, as I mentioned earlier, and there are several forms or brands of feminist criminology that have developed, I think Matthew's assertion would likely come as a surprise to the majority of feminists, and maybe even some non-feminist criminologists. Despite the diversity of feminisms in criminology, there are several general theoretical principles that form the core of feminist criminology. First, gender matters. What I mean by that is that gender should not be simply treated as a control variable in criminological research because the social world and all the institutions that comprise it are gendered. Second, gender is socially constructed and the gender categories that are created are typically differentially valued in any social setting which results in gender inequality. Third though, gender inequality intersects with other inequalities including racism, classism, heterosexism, ageism, and ableism, to form a matrix of oppression, as Patricia Hill Collins called it, that impacts the everyday lives of women and men, including their risk of criminal victimization and offending, and their treatment as clients or employees of the criminal legal system, as the case may be. But fourth, feminism is not just a theoretical framework. It is also a social movement. Feminist criminologists are scholar activists whose research informs collective action with the goals of eliminating gender oppression and other inequalities and promoting equity. Feminist criminologists strive to develop evidence-based knowledge that empowers individuals and groups to act to change behaviors and conditions that are harmful or oppressive. In short, feminist criminology is a paradigm that studies and explains criminal offending and victimization 
as well as institutional responses to these problems as fundamentally gendered, and it emphasizes the importance of using scientific knowledge we acquire from our study of these issues to influence the creation and implementation of public policy that will alleviate oppression and contribute to more equitable social relations and social structures. Now I say this confident that individuals who identify as from feminist chronologists agree with these basic principles of, principles of the paradigm, even though there is no single unitary feminist perspective in criminology. There is no one true feminist criminology. That many feminist criminologists offer various rifts on some or all of these tenets does not indicate, though, that we are all uncertain what we mean by feminist criminology. Likewise, Matthew's assertion that in the past 10 years, quote, feminist criminology, like feminism in general, has lost much of its radical impact and has gravitated towards liberal feminism, <coughs> focusing increasingly on specific issues rather than engaging in wider debates about patriarchy and gender inequalities, would come as a surprise to most, if not all, feminist criminologists. To be sure, many feminists, including feminist criminologists, have chosen to focus their research and activism on specific <coughs> issues. It's pretty hard not to, right? Um, addressing various forms of violence against women throughout the world is one example of concentrated feminist research and activism that's been going on for more than just the past decade. Nevertheless, this research and activism have largely been shaped by and taken place within the context of heated feminist discourses, not only about patriarchy and gender inequality, but also in relation to globalization, human rights, and international law, conflict, and peacemaking. Moreover, the impact of this research and activism is measurable. While some of the outcomes might be described as liberal feminist, and I am well aware that this brand, branding is derogatory in Matthew's radical circles, as it is in Wright and Delissi's conservative circles, but for different reasons, I doubt the women, men, and children who have been the beneficiaries of this research and activism care much about those kinds of labels. It is true, as I and other feminist criminologists have pointed out, that feminist criminology has not succeeded in transforming mainstream criminology. But critical realist criminology has so far failed in that regard as well. More concerning, though, is the fact that Matthews appears to be unaware of the state of contemporary feminist criminology. Much of what he represents as feminist chronology was published more than two decades ago. Now, I'm not going to detract from the contributions made by the feminist criminologists whose work he discusses because they were groundbreakers in this area. But it's nonetheless the case that there have been significant developments in feminist criminology in the intervening years. Most concerning to me, however, is that as I read realist criminology, I was struck by the number of missed opportunities to identify potential connections between critical realism and feminist criminology, an oversight that I think is common in much critical criminology. These are areas that appear ripe for mutually beneficial dialogue and collaboration between critical criminologists and feminist criminologists. Let me just briefly discuss three of these. One, epistemology and research methods. Two, a critique of essentialism. And three, commitment to the development of interventions that are, to the greatest extent possible, culturally competent and client or community-centered. These are by no means all of the areas of potential collaboration and dialogue, but they're all I have time for today, so that's what I'll focus on. I get to choose because I'm the speaker. <laughs> I, I chose epistemology and research methods because I see them as foundational. Um, they underlie what we know and, and how we come to know it. So they're, they're the basis of knowledge construction. I need to ask you to indulge me, though, by accepting as given that feminist criminologists strive for what Matthew calls the joined up approach necessary for a viable public criminology. That's an approach that he defines um, as connecting theory, method, and policy in a coherent manner. 
Given my earlier discussion of the core principles of feminist criminology, I don't think this is too much of a leap of faith on your part. So I ask you to just accept that as given. In chapter three of Realist Criminology, titled The Problem of Method, Matthew, Matthews offers a cogent critique of what he calls cookbook criminology, which is familiar to all of us, as well as various forms of empiricism, abstract, functional, inverted, and the tendency of mainstream criminologists to rely heavily on statistical analyses and manipulation to determine causality with reference to a phenomenon of interest. He concludes that statistical analyses, regardless of the rigor of the logic underlying them, are, quote, primitive tools as far as explanation is concerned. Indeed, sophisticated statistical analysis is often used to compensate <coughs> for conceptual weaknesses, he argues. <coughs> Moreover, he notes statistical models, though they are frequently used to predict various outcomes, may fail miserably at predicting the direction of future trends. In place of traditional positivist epistemologies and methods, <coughs> Matthews calls for a commitment to, quote, naturalism and engaging in the lived experiences of subjects, my emphasis, since there is a need to establish a congruity of meaning between researchers and their subjects, combined with the need to understand their experiences, emotions, and aspirations, end of quote. And he discusses ethnography as an example of such a naturalistic approach to data collection. Matthew's critique of positivism and his advocacy of a more naturalistic method are certainly familiar to feminist criminologists. From the outset, feminist researchers have rejected the positivist scientific model of establishing mastery over subjects, demanding the absence of feeling, and enforcing separateness of the knower from the known, all under the guise of objectivity. Instead, feminist researchers have called for research built on the principle of reciprocity between researchers and research participants. This requires the researcher to discard the traditional research practice of establishing and maintaining relational distance from study participants. Notice, for example, that feminist researchers typically use the term research participants rather than research subjects when referring to people in their studies. This is much more than a semantic shift. It, re it reflects one aspect of the feminist principle of reciprocity. Research should not be something that is done to those who agree to participate in a study. Rather, the research process establishes a relationship between the researcher and study participants in which participants give the researcher their time and information, that is, data, and the researcher in turn should give something back to those who participate in the study. Feminist participatory research designs in which those being studied are actual collaborators on the project exemplify reciprocity taken perhaps to its greatest lengths. But reciprocity on the part of researchers may involve something as simple as engaging in self-disclosure by answering personal questions that re research participants may pose to them, <laughs> or suggesting resources and other information that may be helpful to specific study participants, or providing comfort when participants become distressed. Given that participants in criminological research are often revealing private, sometimes traumatic, lived experiences to a stranger, that is, the researcher. Also in support of naturalistic inquiry, feminist researchers strive to adopt an empathic stance toward the participants in their studies. In practice, this means that instead of imposing pre-established response categories or their own words or ideas on research participants, feminist researchers try to give participants a greater and more active role in guiding the direction of the research and attempt to understand the phenomena they are studying from the participants' points of view, that is, participants' emotions, values, and lived experiences. Emotion work, most feminist criminologists would no doubt agree, is endemic to research grounded in feminist epistemology and methods. The feminist emphasis on reciprocity and empathy in research obviously lends itself well to qualitative methods, such as ethnography, as discussed by Matthews, 
But feminist epistemological principles do not preclude the use of quantitative methods, including complex statistical analyses, and feminist researchers value multiple ways of knowing. Many feminist criminologists are perhaps less mistrusting of quantitative methods per se than Matthews appears to be, but I think another piece of common ground is that both feminist criminologists and critical criminologists are wary of how numbers, devoid of theory, may be used to justify inequality or oppression, or to devalue or trivialize a problem, particularly a problem that disproportionately affects, uh, affects marginalized groups. For instance, we know that if the numbers aren't big enough, or the p-value doesn't reach statistical significance, a problem may be dismissed as minor or <clears throat> inconsequential. As Jaffe and colleagues have pointed out, quote, there's nothing inherently problematic with quantitative methods, but instead the problem lies with how statistics have been used, end of quote. At the end of the day, the decision to use quantitative or qualitative methods, or a mixed methods approach, which feminist researchers have also pioneered, should depend, as Jaffe et al. put it, on the purpose of the particular study, the questions being asked, and the type of change, change sought. A devotion to naturalism should never be used as an excuse for shoddy or weak methodology. But that last phrase from Jaffe and colleagues, specifically the type of change sought by the researchers and by the participants, also highlights a point of convergence between feminist criminology and critical realism. Matthew's emphasis on the need for a joined up approach in which theory is tied to method and both are tied to policy in a coherent way is congruent with feminist criminology's commitment to purpose driven research. That is, research that informs policy and produces knowledge that may be used for the development of more just and equitable social relations and institutions. Matthews, in fact, touches on this commonality on page 42, another page where he actually mentions feminist criminology, when he notes that, quote, feminist criminologists have shown the way in working in and against the state to change policies on such issues as rape, domestic violence, and sex trafficking. In addition, feminists have drawn attention to the gendered and patriarchal nature of state institutions, practices, and policies. Unfortunately, he fails to elaborate further, even though there are multiple specific cases, both within a single country, like the United States, and cross-nationally, that could be used to not only flesh out this point, but also to demonstrate the compatibility between feminist criminology and critical realism in this area. Moreover, these cases speak to Matthew's concern regarding the mistakes criminologists usually make when trying to communicate their research to non-academic audiences. We all know how non-academic audiences react to some of their work. You know. <laughs> he writes, and I quote, the problem with a great deal of contemporary criminology is that it's either not presented as a way that makes it accessible to politicians and the general public, or that the policies presented are less than convincing, end of quote. Feminist criminologists and other feminist researchers have disseminated accessible research briefs and summaries of key findings along with their practice and policy implications for years through clearing houses, research centers, and researcher practitioner partnerships. Indeed, I would argue that feminists have shown the way on this front as well. Let me turn now to the second area of potential collaboration, a critique of essentialism. In comparing critical realism with cultural criminology, Matthews notes that the two approaches share a, quote, mutual distrust of the overly rationalized conception of man, his term not mine, in rational choice theory. And he offers a very thorough critique of rational choice theory. My reading of this brought to mind black and multiracial feminist critiques of essentialism. Essentialism is the assumption that fixed characteristics are attached to bodily identities, such that all members of, say, group A basically think and act the same, whereas all members of group B, while thinking and acting the same as one another, think and act 
fundamentally differently from members of Group A, right? The black and multiracial feminist critique of essentialism developed in response to what these theorists labeled hegemonic feminism. That is, feminism that regards the experiences, attitudes, and values of white, middle-class, heterosexual women as the normative standard and foregrounds gender differences and gender inequalities, specifically men's dominance of women, while downplaying or ignoring differences within gender, as well as other subordinating statuses based on race and ethnicity, social class, sexual orientation, age, and physical ability. But their argument is not simply to be cognizant of diversity. Rather, one must analyze the differences in power that are attached to these diversities. Black and multiracial feminists emphasize both power relations embedded in socially constructed differences and how the intersection of these differences mutually construct one another as unjust systems of power that is interlocking hierarchies that operate both at the institutional, that is the macro level, and through everyday micro social interactions. Although the black and multiracial feminist critique of essentialism and the matrix of domination framework were developed by feminists of color, they're applicable to all groups of women and men because everyone experiences privilege and oppression, advantages and disadvantages resulting from intersecting inequalities. At the same time, no one is completely determined or controlled by these inequalities. Everyone has some degree of agency. Thus, people's simultaneously held multiple statuses and identities will result in members of a specific group facing both common and divergent challenges to which they may sometimes respond in a similar unified way and other times in very different ways. <coughs> Matthew's critique of rational choice theory points to the perspective's <coughs> erroneous essentialism, and I think it's worth quoting at length. He says, rational choice theories, rational choice theories enduring problem, however, is that not all people act in the same way when placed in the same situation and exposed to the same temptations or incentives. To explain these variations would require an understanding of individual agency. Thus, the ultimate limitation of rational choice theory is that it is too one-dimensional and does not adequately capture the complexities of social life. People act out of habit, jealousy, friendship, loyalty, and sympathy, as well as self-interest." End of quote. Few, if any, feminist criminologists would disagree with this critique. But many feminist criminologists would extend it, maintaining that in addition to the various motivations Matthews has listed, one must also consider the privileges and constraints of people's social locations and the power relations attached to them. Although elsewhere in the book, Matthews discusses the significance of social class as well as power and the structure and agency debate, these social relations are presented as degendered and for the most part, de-raced. Even when discussing Philippe Bourgeois' work, in which Bourgeois himself emphasizes the importance of gender, race, and class relations in understanding drug dealing, drug use, violence, and their consequences for residents of impoverished inner city neighborhoods, Matthews overlooks the significance of the intersectional nature of bourgeois analysis in favor of the cultural and ethnographic dimensions of it. So although a critique of essentialism offers some common ground for critical criminologists and feminist criminologists, the intersectional framework that was developed by black and multiracial feminists in response to this critique does not seem to have attracted the attention of critical realists. <coughs> okay, finally, um, I'll turn to the third area of potential commonality, interventions that work. Matthews maintains that, quote, interventions are likely to work only to the extent that they connect with the sensibilities and propensities of the subjects to whom they are directed, end of quote. Like other critical realist criminologists, he decries the right realist crime control policies that extol getting tough on crime. And at the same time, he is vociferous in his criticism of radical liberalism and its frequent accompaniment, liberal pessimism, which claims that crime is getting worse, crime control is getting more repressive, and there is little anyone can do about either. The challenge, Matthews correctly states, 
is how to balance criminal justice intervention against security, crime control against vulnerability to victimization. Matthews is surprisingly sanguine in his discussion of recent developments in crime control policies. He notes a shift from reacting to crime through a top-down, state-centered hierarchical model of control to a greater focus on preventing crime, responding to offenders in more flexible and informal ways, for example, forms of restorative justice, and instituting what he calls smarter forms of regulation that involve choice, personal responsibility, self-governance, and greater public participation in the criminal justice process. And he cites neighborhood watch groups as an example. Although he recognizes that these new forms of crime control have the potential for negative or repressive outcomes, his tone is unmistakably optimistic. I quote, these increasingly participatory methods of governance and changing forms of state power create new possibilities for engaging in progressive practice. And he attributes to some degree the recent crime drop and today's declining focus on crime-related issues to these changes in the culture of control. Feathers criminologists, I would argue, share Matthew's position that interventions that are responsive to the needs of those to whom they are directed that is, interventions that are culturally competent and client or community-centered are those most likely to produce positive outcomes. And that's how I would de define what works. As I stated earlier, feminist criminologists, like left readers, <coughs> urge other criminologists and the criminal legal system to take crime, especially the violent victimization of women and girls, seriously. Their activism on this issue resulted in legislative reforms and changes in police and prosecutorial practices, such as intimate partner violence and sexual assault, of which Matthews also takes note, as I mentioned earlier. More recently, however, feminist criminologists, especially those who use an intersectional framework, have identified the negative consequences of some of these policies and practices, particularly for communities of color. Like Matthews, they have called for more flexible and informal, less hierarchical and less punitive, more community-controlled and less state-controlled interventions for responding to at least some of these types of crime, a position, by the way, that Wright and Delissi don't seem to pick up on. Um, I believe, however, that many feminist criminologists would be more tempered in their optimism regarding some of Matthew's observations. For instance, feminist criminologists are more circumspect in their interpretations of the much-lauded crime drop since the crimes of sexual assault and intimate partner violence to which women and girls are most vulnerable are notoriously underreported. Moreover, feminist criminologists would likely balk at Matthew's assertion that, quote, certain forms of fear can be functional inasmuch as it serves to increase vigilance and the taking of precautions. The opposite of fear may not be fearlessness, but recklessness, end of quote. For most women, being vigilant and taking precautions are a routine part of everyday life. Despite precautions, they may still be victimized, often by someone they know and trust. And to suggest that they may not have been vigilant or fearful enough smacks of victim blaming. Feminist criminologists would also scrutinize Matthew's claim of a decreased fear of crime and an increased sense of safety and ask, for whom? There's a large body of research documenting variations in fear of crime by gender, race, social class, age, sexual orientation, and ability. Indeed, an intersectional analysis of fear of crime would be helpful before such sweeping generalizations are made. An intersectional analysis would also likely reveal significant differences in support for various types of interventions, including neighborhood watch programs and local monitoring committees. Hegemonic cultural constructions that equate dangerousness with black males may produce violent, even lethal outcomes if a member of this group is spotted as out of place. And of course, the case of Trevon Martin immediately comes to mind. Similarly, an intersectional analysis would likely show that in many, of commu many communities of color, there is deep skepticism regarding a shift from a less punitive 
state-controlled criminal justice system to one characterized by greater choice and community control. One need only consider the deaths of black men at the hands of police in U.S. cities such as Ferguson, New York, Baltimore, and Chicago. Although not all of these shootings happened before Matthew's book was published in 2014, such brutality is hardly new. It's simply more public due to video cameras and social media. In short, feminist criminologists, but particularly feminist criminologists who use an intersectional framework to understand criminal offending and victimization, as well as responses to both, they deem Matthew's take on shifting crime control strategies as a bit Pollyanna-ish. So where does this leave us? In light of what I said, do I think collaboration between critical realists and critical criminologists more broadly and feminist criminologists is even possible? Well, in my view, the answer to this question depends largely on critical realists and other critical criminologists. After all, it is they who have dismissed or marginalized feminist criminology, not vice versa. In fact, some feminist criminologists have attempted to develop a feminist, critical, realist criminology in order to remedy critical realism's persistent blindness. And so let me conclude by extending an invitation to critical realist criminologists to join feminist criminologists in a dialogue on our commonalities and divergences. Keeping in mind that this endeavor can only be productive if it's entered into with genuine openness, mutual respect, and a collegial spirit. Such a discussion and collaboration, I would argue, is perhaps even more vital now than it was any time since the 1970s, given that we face the potential of a Trump presidency. But at the very least, the popularity of Trump may foreshadow a resurgence of conservative criminology like that of Wright and DeLisi. And no one, neither critical criminologists nor feminist criminologists, and least of all, socially and economically marginalized groups in our society, will benefit from that outcome. Thank you. Um, I suppose we have time for questions. We have like 10 minutes for questions. Okay, well, thanks. <laughs> sure? Do you have questions? Yeah, well, oh, okay, there's one. Good. Well, I, just have a, I just have a comment. I, I thought that was very interesting, um, what you were saying. I just recently uh, submitted to the Feminist Criminology Journal mm -hmm. for an article, mm -hmm. and the email that came back to me was, uh, thank you, Mr. McDonald, for submitting. <laughs> and so I, I don't know. I guess I saw that and thought, is that actually the default sort of, <laughs> you know, for the okay. email for the feminist criminology <laughs> journal? So I, I will say, I um, when you, I'm not trying to put this on you, but when you submit, they use manuscript central. This is for <coughs> and when you submit, you choose your title, and so the computer automatically uses whatever title you gave it, and if they gave yourself, and if you didn't give yourself a title, it will force the person who's um, sending the message, if it's not sent on the message, forcing yeah. the person who's sent, sending the message to add a title. So it could be that you didn't include a title, and the managing person, I don't think, um, Rosemary Barbaret would <laughs> use that as the default. Um, but there is usually someone who is handling those kinds of things and moving one thing to another box. Um, and I know if I tell Rosemary this, she will just be <laughs> so embarrassed. And I'll tell her. But <laughs> she and I share stuff about journals all the time. But I, that's probably what happened. I mean, somebody just clicked whatever was there. For me, what's more disturbing is that Manuscript Central when you have the, the list of, um, of titles that you can choose. You know, they have doctor, professor, um, that sort of stuff. But Mr. always precedes Ms., Miss, or Mrs. Okay. Yeah. So well, Mr. In, always comes first. In the email exchange, I, I actually said, oh, and I'm, you know, sometimes my first name, Aubrey, could be construed as male, but I am female, and then they just kept on, okay, thank you, Mr. McCall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me tell you, once it's in there, 
It's yeah. in there. I mean, it's really awful. I've tried to get rid of some things. Once it's in there, it's terrible. But yes, that would be disturbing for feminist phonology. I'm going to tell Rosemary. She's got to shape up. <laughs> Harder communities of color. 
And so now what you see um, within feminist criminology is a real effort to say, wait, this isn't what it should be. Um, and so you have Beth Ritchie, for example, writing about um, alternative ways of still taking those crimes seriously, but not having that sort of impact. So, uh, and there are huge, there are huge debates among feminists themselves about trafficking and anti-trafficking legislation and services for trafficking victims. Um, I was giving a talk uh, at a conference about some research I had done with service providers on what they saw as the need um, in terms of services for trafficking victims. And I mentioned one particular disagreement about the types of services. And someone raised their hand and said, who would ever say that? You know, that's, and this other person in the audience says, well, I would. And they got into this big argument. That was the end of my talk. Um, <laughs> was um, but it was because of this tremendous debate. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, in some ways, with regard to, to trafficking, we're where we were 35 years ago with intimate partner violence in a lot of ways. I and mean, some of those same debates I see being created. I hope we've learned enough so that we don't go down the exact same path. But I think feminist criminologists are critical to addressing that very, very serious concern. And I think not all of them, but there's certainly a, a, a group of feminist criminologists who are working on that. Um, Lee Goodmark is one, uh, John Coker at the University of Miami, um, and that's which is a great example. Um, but there are many. So I think that's really important. Great question. Other questions? Very sadly, we're out of time. Oh. Even if we are out of time. <laughs> but there's no lag to the next panel. Okay. Let's wish your safe travels back. <laughs>